So ladies and gents, my name is Cole Kennedy, and today we are going to be going over how to make a closed terrarium. Uh, I really try my best to try and get this video to where I would be doing it alongside you and whatnot, but I only got 10 minutes, and that, in my opinion, is basically impossible because I have tried and tried and tried. But let's get going. We're going to start off with the materials that you need for a closed terrarium. And also, I want to remind you that I'm going to be telling you materials that basically make this, like, free. And that you don't have to go to the store and buy anything. Because we're in COVID-19, we're not supposed to be doing that. But you can go out on a hike or on a walk by yourself and get most of these materials and do this pretty much all for free at home. First deal, you need your... I don't know why, I just forgot what it's called. But you need your enclosure. That's what you're going to be putting your terrarium in. This guy right here used to be an old pickle jar. And he got a new life. And now he holds an entire little world inside him. So that's what I'm talking about, man. Like, I mean, at some point you had to spend money on the pickles. But I don't call that spending money because it was trash that was lying around the house. You can't use plastic or anything like that. It's got to be glass, guys. I will say wine bottles are a lot harder to build terrariums in. Um, it's better when you have a bigger opening so you can put stuff in. But if you get something like long snake tongs, maybe you got the patience to make one in a long necked wine bottle. Either way, you can probably find one of these at home. Let's move to the most important part of a terrarium, and that's the false bottom. So when you go out, you're going to grow and find some like uh, real small pebbles and rocks all about the same size because that's going to be your first layer of the terrarium. The whole idea of the false bottom is you give space for any excess water to hang out so it's not just sitting in all your substrate. When that happens you get putrid soil over time which will also call a uh, cause root rot. That's not good. It kills not only your plants but also kills for the most part any little microfauna you have living in there. Past that, you need a divider to divide the substrate from the false bottom. My divider I used was a piece of parchment paper. Put it on top of a rag, grabbed a toothpick, punched a bunch of little tiny holes in it so water could still run through to the false bottom. Uh, other ways you can make a divider, um, old shopping bags from King Supers, old Ziploc baggies, saran wrap, the only thing that you have to do with all those is poke all little holes in them and, you know, measure out to see how much you need to cut out of it in order to put it over your false bottom. You want a little bit extra on the side so don't measure it perfectly. You want a little bit that lips up so it really creates a better barrier between your substrate and your false bottom. Then we go to our soil. We want to get good soil that already has microfauna in it. Microfauna being cool guys like that little springtail right there. All right, he looks gross now, but to the naked eye, he looks more like that. These guys are hugely essential for the health of your plants and your ecosystem inside your closed uh, terrarium once you're done, because like a worm, these guys recycle the soil, they'll eat mold, and then they poop that fertilizer out, and your plants are happy-go-lucky. So, a uh, great place is to find really good soil. You're gonna look for places with lots of leaf litter. You remove that leaf litter, and you dig up some of that soil I'm telling you it's going to be full of microfauna. It's going to be nutrient rich soil. Another place to look is underneath trees, especially pine trees. Get those needles out of the way and dig up that dirt. Going past that, you got to get your flora. Okay, when it comes to flora, especially if you're making a closed terrarium where you're trying to touch it as minimal as possible, do as minimal maintenance to it, you got to take into consideration what kind of plants do I need. Um, a great flora that works in almost any closed terrarium is moss. And moss sounds kind of boring, but once you put moss in a terrarium and you watch it really thrive and grow, um, it's pretty incredible. You can find moss almost anywhere. And moss is really cool because it's hard to get moss too wet. While a lot of other plants, you can get them too wet and they're done though. Uh, and this guy, I have a cactus from Grand Junction. Uh, these little plants, these little succulents broke off some succulents here and I just threw them in there. The whole idea is I did not want this to be a very wet terrarium, so you got a lot of dry plants. That will also not need too much maintenance over time. And then this last little bit of grass in the back, 
and that grass was literally growing in the crack of the street. So if that thing can grow in the, the crack of a street, I'm hoping he's going to do fine in my terrarium. You move on to non-living installations. You see, it's not just plants in here. I got dead leaves. I got cool rocks. I got some little tiny little pine cones, stuff like that. These are just to add to the aesthetic. Uh, I put small pieces of snakeskin in before, which made a really cool effect. Feathers I found on the ground. I found a little wasp nest one time, and I put that in a larger project that I made. Um, uh, and it was just a really cool effect. Um, basically, this is where you get to be creative. Uh, it's it's really cool, and I would I just can't wait to see whatever whatever you guys make. Honestly, one thing I will say, I put the dead leaves in there. Um, uh, because they'll also act as great, hear me, great food for my ice pods. Uh, ice pods, also known as roly polies, which are another great little fauna to put in these things. The only thing I say is with um, ice pods is sometimes if you don't have enough leaf litter and whatnot for them to eat, they'll possibly start eating your, your plants. Add ice pods with caution. Aside from that, there's not much else. I'll show you some tools that can help a lot with this. Um, uh, I really like a little paintbrush. This can help with, you know, sometimes when I'm dumping in dirt and whatnot, I might get some on my plant. And I don't want a dirty plant when I'm about to close the terrarium so I can wipe off my little plants. Um, uh, wipe off the inside of the container. This guy, like he's been around for a while now. Um, I have a worm or two worms in there and sometimes at night the worms I am not kidding you will track sand all the way up to here and so I open up the terrarium for a little bit let it kind of dry so the sand gets you know dry and then I can go in there with this guy and push all the sand back down make it look presentable again the paintbrush not only comes in handy when you're making it but comes in handy down the road snake tongs I don't think any of y'all got snake tongs unless you're a fellow snake slash lizard slash amphibian o owner like myself. Uh, these guys help a lot, but there are plenty, 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 plenty of alternatives. The blunt end of a fork. Um, this is a terrible example of scissors, but um, uh, scissors you see more at like a school where it's more long and skinny and you know how the handle's kind of like angled at one side. If you're really gentle with it, you can literally kind of pick up the stem of a plant or non-living installations and place them in your enclosure. Also, a straw. One of the number one tips when you make a terrarium is, especially if you're doing a closed terrarium, put less water. Like less water is best. Less is best. Because you can always go back and put in more water, but you can't go like... I mean, you can open your terrarium and let it dry out, but then you run the risk of letting it dry out too much. And I'll be honest with you, once you close the terrarium and they get used to that atmosphere, they get used to that environment, plants start drying out. Um, even the bugs, you know, they'll freak out. So I like to use a straw and then I can just do little, little drops on each of my plants. Bloop. And that's a really great way of watering them um, and not putting too much in there. One thing that a lot of people like to put in their false bottoms is activated charcoal. So you can go get that from a fire pit. Literally just grab some of that charcoal and bring it in. And you don't want, you don't want like, you don't want ash. You want like the charcoal. And then you want it crushed up into kind of like small pebbles again. And you sprinkle that in with your rock uh, false bottom layer. And the charcoal acts as not only an, an absorbency for the false bottom, so it absorbs the excess water, but it also filters that water too. Um, personally, I can get away without it, um, but at the end of the day, you know, it probably does help longevity. That is pretty much it. It's fun, it's easy, it's great for stress management. Take a deep breath, bring nature into your own room. Um, if you guys want to build on top of this, there's this guy on YouTube called Serpa Design, S-E-R-P-A-D-E-S-I-G-N, Serpa Design, all one word. This guy does incredible installations. He shows you how to make one for free just out of your local flora and fauna. 
He shows you how to make a jungle one. He shows you how to make a desert one. Uh, this guy does incredible stuff. So look up that guy if I'm not challenging you enough. It's hard to do it in 10 minutes too. But aside from that, um, thank you guys. I really appreciate y'all. Just know we're going to get through this. Um, and we're going to come out stronger than ever. Let's keep going. Let's stream, uh, stay Maverick strong, you know. We got this. Thank <music> you.